Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Sam. How's it going? I'm great, thanks. How are you? Yay, I'm so good. <laughs> I just realized we're like swapped. We just did a dress rehearsal and we've swapped sides. So I'm all like, what? No, I know. Totally cool. <laughs> um, welcome, everybody, uh, live on Facebook and YouTube. My name is Jody Prosnick and our guest at Music Arts Collective today is the amazing and wonderful Sam Hindel. Hurrah, hurrah. Yay, thank you from for having me. Calgary, Alberta. Um, I am really excited to share Sam with all of you um, because she is an awesome uh, human and um, a leader in the arts community in her own right and full of wisdom and knowledge. And we're going to pick her brain and find out a little bit about Sam and her background and um, yeah, what she has going on. And the reason why we're even connecting is because of the wonderful, there's a wonderful organization called Buckingham Palace in Calgary, Alberta. That is a beautiful home that has opened up to concert, a concert series there. And uh, Lisa Buck, who's the, I guess the CEO or the She's sort of the artistic director, so to speak, um, reached out to me a few months ago when the pandemic hit and was really looking to support artists in, in Calgary and Alberta, but beyond because of the internet. Now we can reach people beyond. Um, and so she reached out and said, hey, would you be interested in, in working on some webinars uh, for our organization? And then she said, I know the perfect person to collaborate with. And Sam and I connected and I just <laughs> fell in love with her. And I think we yeah. talked for, I don't know, like two hours, yeah, maybe over two, two hours, hours, over two hours <laughs> because we have a lot in common. <laughs> Yeah, and kindred, uh, kindred spirits. spirits. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I'm really excited to share a little bit of the conversation with all of you on Facebook today. But the first thing we want to do is just chat a little bit with Sam about who you who you are. Well, first of all, for those of you who may not know who I am, my name is Jody Prosnick. I'm a bass player, composer, and educator here in the west coast of Canada. Um, and um, Music Arts Collective is a new um, uh, endeavor with a couple of partners here on, uh, in Canada. Um, bringing information and education and opportunities to people to just be their awesome, creative, imaginative selves in music. Um, and another thing that we are really curious to explore is um, some very strong and brilliant women and women identifying um, artists in the community. And Sam is one of those people. So she is a sound technician. Um, and... Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her. I have a few notes. So she grew up in Calgary and went to Mount Royal, um, trained at the Banff um, Center for the Performing Arts, the most beautiful facility, probably one of the best in the world, nestled in the Mount, the Rocky Mountains. Um, and it has world-class facilities and world-class artists and world-class faculty. And so Sam is one of the pillars of that community. Um, and brings gorgeous music to that community and beyond. Um, she works as summer staff there and she actually trains technicians up at Banff um, in the theater and arts department. She's also the monitor tech at Jack Singer Concert Hall, the beautiful hall in Calgary. Um, and she's toured North America and Europe with different shows. Um, she has a long and like amazing history in the industry um, and is well loved, <laughs> so well loved that Anusha Shankar, Anushka Shankar, who came and did one show, one show at the Jack Singer and fell in love with Sam, as everybody does, <laughs> as a monitor tech and invited her to tour with her across North America. Um, unfortunately, though, the pandemic hit and the dream to be part of that team evaporated for now, but I'm sure it will come. I'm sure it will come back. We're just we're in an inhalation period. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, Sam's also uh, run the virtual jazz YYC International Jazz Days and was hired by the Ottawa Jazz Festival to help curate and, and implement their own virtual festival. So I cannot say enough about this this person. You oh, are amazing. You. <laughs> and I also want to say as someone who um, spent most of the time on stage, but has done a little bit of behind the scenes, administration, arts admin world in that world. Um, people like Sam, my friends, are the, the lifeblood of the arts world. <laughs> they are behind the scenes, making everything happen, making the beauty happen. 
They do it quietly. They do their job incredibly well. And um, as much as we talk about all the people on stage, the, there's thousands of people behind the scenes who make all the theater and dance and visual art happen. They, the curators, the technicians, the marketing folk, the, the people writing the grants and keeping everything rolling. So anyway, I know I'm enthusiastically like this is a big entry, but I just want everyone to know how much we celebrate you and oh, people you. like you who do the great work that you do to help the artists make their art. So thank Sam. you. Yay for <laughs> Sam. Hey. Woo, yay. Okay, Sam, I have some questions for you. Okay. But my first question is um, how did you even find yourself becoming a technician? Because 5% of the industry, right? Women, five, five, yeah. wait, women only make up 5%. So anyone who's sort of this beautiful flower that grows in the sound tech garden, that's a little different than the other flowers. Like, how does that even happen? How did that happen? <sighs> well, that's a good question. I started doing theater and sound in high school. My high school here in Calgary had a very small but actual theater, not just the cafe gymnatorium that you find in lots of schools. We were quite lucky to have our own little space. So I actually started like probably most technicians who either start as a musician or an actor. I was in the cast and I'm sure I was, you know, I didn't have a very large speaking role, but I was part of the chorus and mm -hmm. a couple of the Greek plays. And at one point they gave me a drum and um, there was an, like a small accident at the theater. The girl that had was running the lights had broken a whole lot of glass into the lighting board. And my instinct was like to try and help and to figure things out. And they said, oh, you're just an actor. You can't help us. Oh. And that was pretty much the moment where I was like, this isn't enough and I'm not, <laughs> I don't know that I really felt that sort of joy and need of the audience. So I sort of shifted gears at that point. And cause there, there was already a lighting tech and honestly, I kind of thought lighting was a bit easy. So I started doing sound and then I ran sound for our main stage high school productions, as well as the weekly theater sports league. So I would have meetings with the theater sports director and we figure out what, uh, sketches they were going to do and I'd plan out the music and I'd play back all the music and run the mic and sometimes it was even just that intuitiveness of knowing when the scene was over right. and stage managing it as well and calling the blackout like just right. knowing so I started in high school you started in high school yeah that's amazing and then were you like okay this is my life path or were you like well no the way this is just fun I'm really enjoying this but it's fun so I'm going to do something else. And then like, so how, what happened after high school for you? I guess it was sort of both. I loved theater and stage managing and sound and that whole world. But I remember having some conversations with my family and one of my cousins was in a similar boat between mm. dance and science. And I was theater and science. And ever since grade 11, I knew I wanted to be an earth and atmospheric scientist. And I knew all the courses I needed to take and what grades I needed to get into which schools next. So I actually took our Earth and Atmospheric Sciences for a year in post-secondary, but then they were changing the program, the curriculum. So some of the classes I was taking, they weren't even going to be applicable, which I thought was ridiculous. And so then I had, you know, a quarter life crisis and switched into nursing because I figured <laughs> they need nurses. I care about people. I can memorize a cell. Let's do yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. So that was the winter semester and I couldn't actually take any nursing courses because I had never taken biology. So then I took third year stats, which was the only course I could take in the nursing stream and grade 12 biology. And I kept skipping uh, the stats class to go and work on a play that was across the street. I was really? stage managing a show. And then the nursing timeline all fell through and then I couldn't go into nursing because well, the course I took didn't time out with when my grades needed to be in to apply. And so, you know, the saga continued of what am I going to do with my life? Right. And then my dad is the one that said, why don't you just go into theater? Right. So I applied to Mount Royal and I got into the tech program there. And then the rest is history. Wow. 
sometimes the <laughs> obstacle is the path, right? You're like, I want to yeah. go this way. And then there's things that are just like oh, getting in your way. And you're like, wait, wait, I want to, I want to go that way. And then it takes that sometimes like a little birdie flying onto your shoulder saying, but there's this other path over here that's kind of like, free and easy <laughs> that yeah, seems, like, it seems like a good choice yeah mm. it seemed like you could it was easier to do science as a career and theater as a hobby right as opposed to the opposite but mm. then it became clear like theater was just the path theater was the path <laughs> theater was the path oh my gosh um i so relate to that you know sometimes it's like um you know, I always say when people say, when did you choose music? I'm like, never. It just chose me. It just, it just, the path just sort of showed up oh, yeah. in front of me. And I was always really um, amazed by people who are like, I'm going to do this thing. And they have the whole plan and they're like, blah, blah, blah. And I, I uh, was never really that person. I'm still not really that person. <laughs> I kind of just, the minute I try and have a plan. Wait. It, why don't you just do music? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just do music. I'm like, but music's scary. And like, what do you even do? Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think, you know, we were chatting earlier about women in the arts. And I know even for me, like, uh, I know I was a good student. I'm sure you were too. So it's like, well, the logical thing, you know, I thought I might do medicine or something or law, maybe. I really enjoyed law. Um, and I was like, okay, those seem like you go to school, you train, and then you become that thing. And music or the arts just seems like this, like, what do you even do? Like, how does that even work? Like, how do you, you even get, write a resume? How no do you, I know. Well, what what is it? Like, what does a life in music, especially, like, for me, in jazz music, well, what does that even look like? So, um when you're trying to make these decisions about where to go and what to do, I think that there's a certain, um, I don't know, for me, a pragmatism, like, well, if I'm going to spend all this money on school, I have to be able to pay off these student loans. And how am I going to do that playing bass? I don't know. So there was a lot of like questioning, but the good news is, um, you know, I just, there was a whole, uh, my story is wacky, but there was just the universe just said, you were doing this. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, kicking and screaming. But like, no, they're like, no, you're, you're doing this. And um, so, yeah, um, I you love to follow your heart. Yeah. I mean, it's easier said than done. It's like, it sounds so like rainbows and butterflies, just follow your heart. There's a lot of sweat and grit and tears and uncertainty and, um, you know, I would say like imposter syndrome and questioning oh, yeah. and like, get me out of this, right? Um, yeah. This is a weird thing. I don't, there's nobody around here that really looks like me doing this. And I, you know, who do I look to as a model or a mentor? Oh, so I have a question for you. Yeah. Kind of swinging back to, um, actually, I'm going to ask this. I'm doing it out of order. But so, you know, hopefully you haven't planned your script. <laughs> oh my gosh. But if you were to go back to that young tech um, when you first started and to, we're going to give her some advice. Or, you know, I mean, what do you give your young tech students? What, what do you tell them? What's the, your advice for them what, and for you, ultimately? I mean, maybe it's the same. Maybe it's just getting better at actually living it. But I would say it's about letting yourself fly and fail mm -hmm. and not being so af don't be so afraid to look like you don't know something mm -hmm. which i think is a huge hurdle because there the world of sound is so vast and digital mm -hmm. consoles and equipment and gear and speakers and the personnel involved and who is the tour manager for rem and who is the guitar tech for led zeppelin and what <laughs> speaker number is here is this like I don't know. Sometimes, you know, you're just like, mm hmm. So that's the but. equivalent of what drummer's on this 1956 <laughs> album with like, Cannonball Adderley. Oh my God. <laughs> I, really like, remember I don't the know. The guys that knew all those, like the personnel. I married a guy who's like knows all the players on every track, uh, like, you know, especially 80s music. Like, you know, who was the producer? Who was the bass player? And I was like, ah. 
have oh yeah so and so do i need to know all that exactly do i need to know all this and i think it's just knowing like no you don't need to know all that and it's okay to not know all that because i know different things or the things i know or spend my time honing aren't those exact same things and that's okay right so i would for example what what are those things what are those like attributes that you know have helped have served you and are maybe well, unique to you. Yeah, I think it does sort of tie into the Anushka Shankar story too, mm-hmm. which is even growing up, I thought, what are my hobbies? I don't know. All I do is like talk on the phone and hang out with my friends. But so f- I've learned, oh, I've really worked on my interpersonal skills and being able to read a room and read people's vibe and their body and, you know, and doing monitors, a lot of it is. Some musicians, you know, they give you big symbols for when they want something changed. So like guitar, uh, <laughs> you know, vocal, uh. but working the Anushka Shankar show, she would give me monitor cues like this. Mm-hmm. And that meant sitar up. Mm-hmm. And then instead of being like, good, good, you know, she's just like. Mm. I thought, I've tried my whole life for this moment. Mm. I spent so much time in junior high and high school, you know, trying to communicate with someone across the classroom and it's all these symbols and things. And then you're being subtle, like, "Mm, it's over there. And I Mm -hmm. thought, oh, yes. And I took her cues, super subtle. The audience didn't know her hands are full. So we had that connection and it was then, you know, it just clicked and the human side of sound and the personality side of being there, essentially the only tech on stage there for the band and knowing that my energy, I mean, in some ways it can be palpable. And when I train the students too, I'm like, please don't be on your phone this whole time. Like they're out there, you know, giving it, you're on stage. Everybody can see you. Like Mm -hmm. everybody can see it too when they're trying to communicate with you and you're not getting it. So. Wow. Just, you know, being so yourself and believing in yourself and what you contribute is special. It's It reminds me of this, uh, of this idea of the nonverbal communication, um, understanding that you're bringing energy into the space and what is that energy you're bringing into the space. Um, and that musicians in particular are kind of sensitive to that, whether they admit it or not. I mean, yeah. when they enter a space and there's the, the texts are, you know, there's a calmness and, a, you know, uh, it's very, um, it's very cool. Like you, you just relax a little bit, a little yeah. bit more and you know well, that they're I, on your side and they're here, they're just to support, you know, for oh, sure. Yeah. For I sure. sort of say how good they think your show sounds, sounds starts when they walk in the door. Like, do they trust you? Are you giving off, you know, the vibe? And are you actually there for them? Are you paying attention? Do you care? Mm -hmm. Are you listening? What a skill for a sound tech to have, listening. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It means a lot of things. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. (laughs) Well, I think that there's some, like, um, life lessons here, just, you know, and how to how to have those connected relationships and to move in the world where you're a net positive. We used to always say, you know, it's almost like citizenship. It's like, you know, uh, you know, just being tuned in to what's happening in the room and in, in the community that you're finding yourself in and how am I serving this situation, right? How am I? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, musicians are the same. The really great ones are the ones where you know they have their satellite dishes out and they're, you know, tuning in Um, and it's something we're all looking at and has changed so much in the past seven months mm, really seven months yeah oh my gosh i could talk to you all day i could talk to you all day i have other questions so we have about 10 minutes so i want to know um okay i i want to know if you have any thoughts on um sort of encouraging more women and women identifying people to to get involved in the field you know what are some of the barriers that you see and if you were to give a message to a shout out to 
to young people who are curious about a career? I mean, obviously right now everything's weird. We'll talk about that in a second, but um, what would you say? What would you, what would be your advice? I think women, we should, you know, the modern day script is supporting other women and trying to not stop the search. Like I'm, I would love to keep mentoring more females and, if you have an opportunity for a younger person and that is your goal, then don't stop if you don't get those applicants, you know, maybe it's Mm. that only five, 10 guys apply. Well, I think there's a lot of hesitancy as a woman to think that we're good enough to apply Mm. for things or to even step up. Like I used to barely even feel comfortable saying I was a sound tech because the people I would look up to, I was like, they're sound techs. Mm-hmm. But then I would do some gigs and some, you know, young guy shows up all macho, like I'm the sound tech and they don't know how to do half the things I know how to do. Right. And then I think maybe I am a sound tech. I don't know, but I look up to people. So I think, again, it's stuff you to still keep telling yourself is to just believe in yourself and get out there and that you, chances are you're probably not I don't know, the dumbest person in the room and that you are worth this. So I, (laughs) which I think is a fear people have. Like I still do webinars and I'm hesitant to ask the question because I don't want to be the girl that doesn't understand. And I'm the only one there, right? But then people ask other questions and I think, oh, okay, maybe my question is more advanced than I think. So I think giving women more opportunities to, yeah, fly and to fail and doing recognizing it's scary to fail and we maybe aren't as accustomed to being comfortable with doing that publicly and in Mm. live sound Mm. everybody knows when there's Mm -hmm. feedback even if it was the artist's Mm -hmm. fault who to turn around and look at Mm. so it can be quite intimidating and to just Mm. know that it's a good part of it and so I think we need to create some safe spaces for women to ask questions and to be heard and to have chances to grow and succeed. Right. You know, it's very similar to improvising in a sense because it's like public exploration and you're just like, you know, yeah, it's, it, there's a vulnerability around that. And I think young women in particular, culturally, you know, we, I don't know if you've ever read Brené Brown's The Gift of Imperfection, but she there's this whole beautiful long list of, you know, you need to be smart, but not too smart. You need to be sexy, right. but not too sexy. Uh, you need to be uh, assertive, but not too assertive. You need oh, to yeah. be la la la. And uh, I was ready reading that and like, oh my God, no wonder we're all like, I don't know what, you know, it's like a paralyzed, we get paralyzed because we are so afraid. And that's the thing, like, what I started noticing was all these really assertive, mediocre guys. <laughs> They're everywhere. <laughs> I mean, I'm just like, I, if I only, if only had a little bit of your confidence oh. in my pinky. Oh, my God. Like, But I was always like, you know, and also I think, too, when you're one of the few women doing the thing, I always used to feel pressure. Like, oh yeah, I'm representing, like, I can't suck. Me too. Or Still. women will look like, oh, women suck. Cause look, and you don't want to be the token woman. That's not no, good. No, that and that's like really, I get so exhausted, you know, yeah. with that too. Um, and then you always wonder, oh, am I getting this because they're like, we need diversity. Oh, you are the only one. Like, we'll have you adjudicate all the festivals because we need a woman. A Seize woman. it, do it. So we Emily, so like, is this because I actually know what am I doing? Like. But I think, I, I think you and I, we talked about how you get to a certain point in your career when you've been doing it long enough that you're able to have these conversations and say, <laughs> you know, well, yeah, we're fine. We're, we're, we're good. <laughs> like we do yeah. our thing. There are people who are better than us. There are people who are not as good as us. We're somewhere doing our thing. And really, um, doesn't really matter. You know, like if you, as long as you are, um, yeah, just, I don't know, just giving, I always give 110%. That's actually all that's really required with the acknowledgement that everything's process. You are going to continue to get be- better and deeper and stronger, especially in the arts. There is no end point where you're perfect, oh, yeah. right? I think and that if is you stay what's curious. Really, yeah, really seen is the effort. Mm-hmm. Like there are people I've never done sound for that's, you know, say how good of a sound tech I am. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. think it's just knowing that I 
care and I'm paying attention and it's the effort. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Ah, okay. So I am going to pivot to, we usually we do like a rapid fire round, um, but before we do that, the last kind of rapid fire question round, um, I want to just talk a little bit about what we're doing next weekend because. Great. Yeah. So yeah. exciting. So uh, both Sam and I, when the pandemic hit, had to quickly pivot to online. So for me, it was online, a lot of live stream concerts through a lot of festivals, working with people like Sam out here on the coast. But then I pivoted all my teaching um, to online. And through that, learned a ton because I was doing it all summer. I think I lectured about 48 hour and a half lectures um, on a variety of topics from improv to history to all kinds of stuff. Lucky. And um, so, uh, uh, and then Sam, you want to chat about a little bit about how you pivoted? Oh, yeah. I, same thing. Pivoting practically overnight, steep learning curves, figuring out, yeah. all right, how do we have good sound online? So yes, I worked on a couple festivals, did lots of tests on my own, yeah. did the old like, okay, can people hear me now? I'm scratching this mic and what's that <laughs> noise? Oh, it's the fridge. Like, so essentially transferring the skills to online. And even though I still can't control the settings on your sound card in front of you, it's just using the listening skills and the paying attention skills to enhance how everybody is coming across online. Yeah. So I've done over 190 virtual sound checks. Yeah. Which right? I can hardly believe myself. So in everybody's situation, home studio is different. So yeah, we're going to talk about low tech solutions, higher tech solutions, low budget, high budget, and how to really just get the most out of everybody's own system and the different platforms. Totally. And yeah. I'm going to be talking more about how to take all of your awesome inner wisdom, all the stuff that you know about, and translate that into online platforms through um, engagement building exercises um, and and um, thinking about the aesthetic. Um, anyway, just a lot of like how to cultivate community using your, your online platforms um, and deliver essentially what is almost like a little mini, it's almost like a little mini television show in a, in a way. Um, so how to organize it and, and to make it kind of pop and be awesome and helpful to the people you are reaching with whatever information you're wanting to, to offer them. So, um, so it's really exciting. So that's the one big thing next week. And guess what, you guys, it's free Buckingham Palace yeah. and the amazing crew. Um, the, it's a nonprofit organization. They are sponsoring this. So all you have to do is go to www.buckinghampalace.com and click on the link and sign up for the free webinar next Sunday. And next it's Sunday. an hour and a half. You can ask questions. It'll be great. Um, and then the other little thing that's happening is on November 1st with Music Arts, Amanda Tossoff, my partner, and I, my co-conspirator, we're going to be doing um, an improv workshop. So it's perfect for anyone who is curious about improvisation. Even if you don't have a whole lot of theory, there's going to be stuff for you. And we're approaching it as, a, as games. So if you're a teacher who's new to teaching improv, if you are a classical musician who's curious about improv, if you are a singer songwriter um, or a curious like how does jazz work kind of thing, we're going to scaffold through a bunch of really fun concepts that so even if you're advanced, it may be good to check out just to kind of see how we sort of get people diving into this in a really friendly and fun and empowering environment which is the main thing, right? Because it can feel really intimidating. Sam, what we were talking about, like our worlds can feel very intimidating to people who are like, I kind of want to try that, but I'm scared. Oh, uh, or I, I don't know how that works. Or like, oh, oh it's going to be too advanced for me. And so we will definitely make sure that we're laying things out and as clear, um, the info as clear as possible so that you can have some good takeaways and feel empowered, not like, I don't know anything. So that's the whole point of all of this. So. Yeah, and Yay. we're going to do question and answers as question well. Question and answer, yeah. So I'm actually, like, selfishly so excited to hear your part because I'm sure <laughs> I'm going to get some good tips. <laughs> um, we have, I know we're running a little bit late, but I really do want to do this speed round 
Okay. Speed round slam question before we go. We call this the take five um, after, uh, you know, the hit take five, the jazz hit. So, um, and it's short answer questions and we always end the webinar with a little, you know, speed round. So here's Great. question number one. Are you ready? They say there are usually three people in your life that light a person's spark around your passion. Sometimes a family member, maybe a teacher, a mentor, or a friend. Who is one of those people who lit the spark in you? My dad. Your dad. We've already talked about that. That's amazing. Yeah. What's your favorite time of the day to get work done? Nighttime. Nighttime? Nighttime. Yeah. Evening show calls work for me. I'm very glad. Nighttime. We don't need to be on at 8 a.m. That You're a fits night my, person. Yeah, my that night works. owl clock. Love it. <laughs> What's your favorite venue that you've ever worked in? Oh, ever. Ah, well, I like the big venues. I love the loud sound and all that power and energy, but I love the small venues. When I lived in Tofino, there was a 72 seat theater and I got to work with Stuart McLean and present the Vinyl Cafe. Oh. And that is one of my favorite gigs in that little space. Don't we miss him? I would love oh. to hear him right now. Oh, I know. Uh, That's a yeah. story for another time. <laughs> we'll have to do this again. Yeah, We'll have to do part two. Okay. So, uh, well, how old were you when you, we kind of talked about this. How old were you when you decided that, that theater and, and tech was your path? When you would say, when you finally were like, yeah, this is it. High school. So around 16. 16. Well, and that's when I got bit by the bug, really. Right. Then that's I waffled funny. and confirmed it. But yes. 16. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really want to trust our instincts sometimes. Ugh, We're like, why do we do that? Yeah, why? Um, last one. Do you have anything upcoming that you're really excited about that you want to share with everybody? Yes, coming up at the Jubilee Auditorium here in Calgary. We're doing a Tech Like a Girl program. <gasps> yeah. So I'll be tech teaching sound. Like a girl. Yeah, and so there'll be young women and female identifying people coming in and doing this whole workshop. So we're gonna break it down into lighting, sound and staging, as well as some of the other components, wardrobe, hair and makeup, but I'll be teaching the sound sessions for that. And that is, yeah, really exciting. And it'll actually be, you know, COVID safe, hands on. Mm -hmm. And, but that face-to-face -face time with the young women I think is going to be amazing because I don't know that people even know that these are jobs, let alone that backstage jobs are places women can be. 100%. That is so, you need to come do that in Vancouver. Okay. <laughs> we, need to make I would that, love to. we need to make that a thing. I did a girls jazz day um, twice we've done and they were, they've been like a highlight of my Right. Um, you know, and we didn't even really like we talked a little bit about women and music, you know, the hard times, but really we just got down to playing music together and exploring the craft. Um, and I, you know, we had these amazing women mentors and, and it was just it was a lot of positivity and love and beauty. So, Aww. yeah, just gathering together right for a day of just learning and sort of you know, disarming a little bit. You just take the armor off that you feel like you may exactly. have to wear in, in, in certain environments and just, you can ask the questions. And so, yay, you're a, like a champion Aww. and a leader. And I'm <laughs> so excited to teach this webinar with you. And I'm so grateful that you spent this morning with us. And um, so everybody, buckingjampalace.com, it's free. Um, and uh, yeah, come hang out with uh, Sam and I. And um, yeah, and then go to, you can go to www.musicartscollective.com to workshops. And if you wanna sign up for that improv workshop, which will be fun and there's lots more coming up. Um, again, one of the big gifts is that we're uh, connecting with people all over the country and collaborating on these cool adventures. So, right. so yay. yay, Thank you that. so much for having um, me. Have an awesome day and to everybody out there, mwah. Be safe, be kind as those uh, are. <laughs> Bye.